actually. And I just want to ask this question that I've asked every week just to see where what we've learned. Is it God's will to heal? <laughs> yes, it is God's will to heal. Praise the Lord. If there is a delay in healing, it is for a purpose. Amen. God will never miss an opportunity. So we're so blessed for that. As we're, we're working through the benefits of God from Psalm 103, that's our theme for the year, the different benefits of God, healing was one of them. This month and next month, for May and June, we're looking at another benefit from the Lord. Actually, I want us to turn there just for a moment. Psalm 103, those are the benefits that we've been talking about. Psalm 103, actually for, for some of you that know that off the top of your head, you should memorize that as we've talked about it in our church. Uh, so often, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all of our iniquities, hallelujah, who heals all of your diseases. Yes, Lord. For the next two months, we're looking at the next part, verse 4a, who redeems your life from the pit. God redeems our life from the pit. Thank you, Lord. Over the next two months, we're going to be looking at people who have been in the pit. People who have been in the pit. And this is going to be an incredible series. I am so excited. We're going to be looking at Jeremiah's life. And then uh, toward the end of this month, into next month, we'll be breaking apart Daniel, which will be just an, uh, an amazing series. So I, I want to encourage you. Turn with me, if you will, to the first pit, Jeremiah. We're going to be looking at the pit stop. In each of these uh, situations, we're going to be looking at two, two parts. First is called the pit stop, the individual falling into the pit, how he gets into the pit. Then we're going to be looking at the pit crew, the people that God sends around you when you're in the pit. God will never leave you forsaken. Never, 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 never will he leave you forsaken. God will never leave you alone. And you can study the scripture and you can see all these parts is that if you are in a pit situation in your life, God will send somebody to you. And if God sends no other human to you, he will send you an angel. If he does not send you an angel, he himself will appear to you. He will never leave you alone in a pit. God will always surround you, always be with you. Hallelujah. He will always be with us. Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah chapter 38. We're going to read the first 16 verses, okay? Jeremiah chapter 38, first 16 verses. Let's see if we can do some of these names, okay? Hmm. Now, <laughs> who wants to give that one a crack? Shephathiah. Shephathiah. Now Shephathiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, the Duke, the son of Shalemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malkijah, heard the words that Jeremiah was speaking to all the people. Wow. Whew. Thank God he was just called Jeremiah. Aren't you glad? Thus says the Lord, he who stays in this city. Actually, let me, just before I give you what Jeremiah said, just to give you a quick synopsis of where Israel is. Israel keeps messing up. And Jeremiah was one of the prophets, just like Isaiah, who is prophesying to the nation of Israel, that if they don't turn to the Lord, bondage is coming. They will be led away in captivity. And so Jeremiah is speaking the word. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in this city will die by the sword, and by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live, and have his own life as booty, and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. <laughs> Jeremiah is just telling it plainly. The people kept messing up. He says, that's it. Your enemy is coming in. And that's the only way that you'll survive now, is that the enemy captures you. Then the official said to the king, now let this man be put to death. Who? Who be put to death? <laughs> Jeremiah. <laughs> Inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in the city and all the people by speaking such words to them, for this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. So King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. I just want to say before we read on, Jeremiah is God's mouthpiece. 
All he's doing is obeying God. Do you know that sometimes rough things happen in your life when you're just obeying God? It's all right. It doesn't mean that God has forsaken us. It doesn't mean that God has left us. It means that God is working. Praise God for that. Let's read what happened to Jeremiah, verse 6. Then they took Jeremiah and they cast him into a cistern of Malkijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse. And they led Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern there was no water, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. But Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, while he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. Now the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin, and Ebed, uh, Ebed Melech went out from the king's palace, and he spoke to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they've cast into the cistern. He will die right where he is because of the famine. There is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take thirty men from here under your authority and bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. Isn't that interesting? God let Jeremiah get to the place of almost dying. Okay? So Ebed-Melech took the men under his authority and went to the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn-out clothes, worn-out rags, and let them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Now put these worn out clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah stayed in the courthouse of the guardhouse. Stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that is, in the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I am going to ask you something. Do not hide anything from me. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, you uh, will you not certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. But King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret, saying, As the Lord lives, who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Go with me to the very last verse, verse 28. So Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse until the day that Jerusalem was captured. All right. Whew. Lord, speak to us this morning. I love that quote on, on your page from Desiring God Ministries, uh, John Piper's ministry by one of their pastors, Eric Raymond. He says, hardship is almost as common as breathing. Hardship is almost as common as breathing. The question is not if, but when we will find ourselves in one of the painful pits of life. Is that true? Those of you who have any age to you, you realize, do the pits come? Yeah. Sometimes we dig our own pit, but sometimes there's just pits in your life. Sometimes there's hardship in your life. and We look at God and say, why? Why are we there? That was what was happening to Jeremiah. God called Jeremiah at a young age. Spoke to him to be a mouthpiece. God raised him up. Said, you just speak my words. And Jeremiah was eager to do so. And here's the, the, the crux of what Jeremiah was called to do. To speak against the nation and tell them, you've gone so far. Actually, you could read up to the first 38 uh, chapters. Jeremiah is warning the people, warning the people, warning them. And they are stiff-necked. Will not listen. Will not listen. Listen, a lot of times we're in the same place. We'd rather do our own thing. We'd rather make it through by our own method, our own ways. And it got to the point where Jeremiah says now, enough is enough. The people are coming. You're going to be captured. So he gives this word. He gives this word and says, if you go out to the Chaldeans, your life will be spared. The king of Babylon is coming and he's going to take you over. If you release yourself to them, They'll capture you, but if not, they'll come against the city and kill you. And the people rebel against Jeremiah and say to him, you must die. Wow. I often wonder what, we don't really have a lot of the account of what Jeremiah said to God. I don't really believe he, he complained much, but 
there had to be some question of saying, God, I am saying what you want me to say. And now I find myself in a pit. I, I What a stunning story. There's famine in the land. There's no food. There's a scarcity of water. We know that because it says the cistern was dry. It was just muddy. So they're at the end of their water time. And they drop Jeremiah down by ropes, and it says he sank into the mud. Have you tried? To, have you ever walked through the woods and stepped in mud? At least a foot deep. What happens? Oh, you can't get out. I, I've lost my boot so many times in the mud, and then you, oh, you got to try to fish it out without getting your sock dirty. Jeremiah went down into the mud. All right. Let's break apart this, these passages. There's a, quite a few truths I want us to pull out from here. We'll start with number one on your page. Being used of God does not mean exemption. Being used by God does not mean exemption from the consequences of sinful life. Being used by God, having God on our side, being believers in Jesus does not mean we are exempt from the difficulties of, the, of our life, but it means fortitude through it. It means fortitude through it. Fortitude through it. God will strengthen us through. Thank you, Lord. Remember, he tells us. He says, in this world, we read that last week, in this world, you will have what? Troubles. Troubles. You will have tribulations. You will have problems. But then he says to his it says to the believers, but be of good courage. Why? Because I have overcome the world. He doesn't promise exemption from the consequences of sinful life. It means fortitude through it. Oh, we see that in verse 2. Look at that. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in the city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes after the Chaldeans will live. What a, what a thought that God was telling his people. He said, listen, you're going to go out to bondage. And there you're going to live. God is always looking to provide for his people. God is always looking to bring them to a place where they'll call out to him and he will rescue them and keep them and provide for them. Jeremiah speaks of famine. Then he is thrown in the pit and is starved because of the famine. Isn't that, isn't that unfair? Jeremiah says to the people, I'm warning you, there's a famine coming. And they take him, throw him into the pit. And in fact, an Ethiopian uh, uh, a eunuch, an Ethiopian servant who's walking by and says, he's, we're all starving on the outside. Jeremiah is even more hungry on the inside. Should Jeremiah have gone through that? That's the question we need to ask. Should he have gone through that? I don't even know if I want to say no. Because that's our question, isn't it, to God? Should, do I need to go through this? Should I have gone through this moment in my life? <laughs> While we only see what is fair or unfair, God sees. you got to fill this in. This is so good. While we, only, while we only see what is fair or unfair, God sees the entire storyline. God sees the entire storyline. I keep having the same conversation with so many people. Over and over, when we come with our complaint to God and say, God, you're not being fair in my life. God, you're being unjust in what you're doing. God, if you care for me, if you care for me, wait, we, we always speak that out of our limited not. We always say that to God because we can't see ahead, right? If we knew the whole storyline, the whole picture, oh, it would be a different story for us, right? I, I, I encourage you all the time to read. Read your Bible. Stay in the Word of God. And on top of that, if you read anything else, read missionary books. Read books that encourage your faith. There are books by missionaries that I am continually reading that were missionaries 100, 200 years ago whose lives are challenging me. Do you think at those, the times of their hardship, those missionaries looked and say, 200 years from now, there's going to be a pastor in a small church in a little town in New York, and he's going to be encouraged by what he's reading? I have no idea. We never see the whole story. We don't see what God is doing. But he knows it all. The enemy's plan for Jeremiah is for him to die. <laughs> Isn't that? The plan is 
for him to die. But God has a different plan. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. This next paragraph has three words to fill, and I love these, these three because it's so true in every situation. God preserves his life, Jeremiah's life, and he preserves our life. God preserves his life through difficulty, through difficulty. God preserves his life through difficulty, through special relationships, and compassion in an uncompassionate world. God preserves his life through difficulty. We're going to see that in a minute. Actually, I want, I want you to, you, we're going to notice this together. The pit, the cistern that he was thrown into, while Jeremiah could be at the bottom of there saying, God, you're leaving me to die. And God seemingly left him, right? Starved him. Let him get to the place where he was, we're going to see it in a moment, where he was frail, literally bones. But God allowed him to fall into the pit because he was actually sparing him by keeping him hidden away in a pit. <laughs> God preserves his life through difficulty, through special relationships. Isn't it interesting? The one person who cared for Jeremiah wasn't one of God's own people. Was an Ethiopian eunuch that God sent his way. And God gives him compassion in an uncompassionate world. I, I want you to see, if you are striving to know the Lord, if you are striving to know the Lord, truly you're seeking God and your life is going through a pit moment, that pit is actually God's grace in your life. It's God's grace in your life. We see that even if you, you can, you don't have to turn there, but Luke chapter 15, when you see this, the uh, parable of the, the, uh, the prodigal son, it says that he went away from his father, he squandered his money, went to a faraway land, and then God sent famine. I love that. Uh, in, my, in my Bible, I have the word famine circled and highlighted, and I have next to the word famine, I have it written, the grace of God. If there was not famine, the boy would never have gotten hungry. If he not, did not get hungry, he would not have called out to God and said, what am I doing here? He would never have come to his senses. God arranged the situations of life to so bring pressure that that child could call out to God and say, I want to be restored. And God was willing and waiting to restore him with many more blessings in his life. Many times in our life, the cisterns, the wells, the pits, the hardships of life is actually the grace of God chasing you. The grace of God working something out in your life so that you can know him, he could receive glory, and he could bless you for it. We often miss the little details of God meeting us in the hardness of life because we are too busy expecting God to move by our own standard. We miss the little blessings of God. I keep telling people who are in the pit, people that I'm talking to, evaluating their life, there are details in what you're going through that is actually the grace of God, but we're blind to see it because we only have one answer. God is only God if he removes me from the pit. Well, what if he doesn't remove you from the pit? If he doesn't remove you from the pit, remember delays, delays in healing, delays in deliverance, delays from things that we're going through means that God is working out something. That we have to, ought to have open eyes to say, God, I want to know you, I want to see you, and I want to see the details of what you are doing in my life. God is working something out. We see this here. God did not release Jeremiah immediately, but God was doing small little things. I want you to look at these pieces. Look at verse uh, 6. Then they took Jeremiah out. They cast him into the cistern. <laughs> I love that. They cast him. They, they were not being gentle. They cast him into the cistern of the king's son, which was of the courthouse. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern, there was no water, but only mud. What could he drink? Nothing. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. Look at verse 11. <laughs> when the eunuch was able to help, so Ebed Melech took the men under his authority, went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom, and took from there. This is what I want you to highlight and notice in your word. 
Mark these words in your scripture. Worn out clothes and worn out rags. Worn out clothes and worn out rags. That's something incredible. That is God using a detail of life. What were the worn out clothes? The clothes that people no longer wanted anymore. Good for nothing. Good for cleaning. Good for scrubbing. Nobody could wear them. Nobody could do anything. Something that was just cast away into a room hidden away. God says, that's exactly what we need. I want you to grab those, get all the worn out clothes, get all the worn out rags, and let them down by ropes into the cistern of Jeremiah. Look, look how great God is. Look at verse 12. Then Eben Melech, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, you mark it again, worn out clothes, highlight it. Now put these worn out clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. Why? What's the point of that? Yeah. He's hungry. He's very thin. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't drank anything. They let him down roughly by ropes. They dropped him down into the mud. Deep pits. He's only like, you know, seven feet tall, eight feet tall. We're, we're talking like 30 feet, 40 feet. They drop him down into the pit. He falls in there. He is now in the mud. He's been in the mud for days. He's not coming out of that mud. God sends this Ethiopian to get these worn out rags. and say, Why? They could have just let down ropes and tried to heave him out. But the detail of that, so that he would be okay. So that there would be comfort under his armpits. And God says, I care about you when you're in the pit. See, people don't realize these little details. God is, come on, look at this. God is showing Jeremiah compassion in the evil world. Fill this next one in. This is a good word phrase here. We must recognize rags for our armpit moments. Rags for our armpit moments. <laughs> we must recognize rags for our armpit moments. God, you're not doing anything. God, you're not getting me out of here. God, you're not doing anything in my life. Open your eyes. And you can see that there, God is sending you moments where he is sticking old rags under your arms and saying, my child, I'm gentle with you. I will ease you and care for you and lift you up out of the miry clay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. We often assume that God's kindness is only about mighty deliverances. Watch this next one. But we miss the loving kindness of God through sustaining. Oh, don't you hate that word? We often see the power. We often want the power of God. We assume that God's kindness towards us is only if he delivers us or not. But we miss the loving kindness of God through sustaining. Because we would rather have deliverance than sustaining. It's true. Come on, let's be honest. How many of us would say, oh, keep, me in the, keep me in the hardship? We would all want deliverance, right? I want to be delivered. I want to be set free. I want to come out of what I'm going through. But the loving kindness of God comes through sustaining. God, I need to be delivered. You have no idea what I'm going through. Does he not? Did Jesus want to be delivered from his situation? Did Jesus want deliverance over sustaining? Yes, he did. He says to God, if you can take this cup from me, if there's any other way, take it from me. Don't let me go through this. And God says to him, what? Nothing. Jesus says, I'd rather have your will. And what does God say? Yes, I will sustain you. What did they do to him? They spit at him and God sustained him. They ripped his beard. God sustained him. They whipped his back. God sustained him. They made him carry his cross. God sustained him. They put nails in his hands, nails in his feet, and they God sustained him. Why? Because the greater glory was in our freedom. 
the greater glory was in what we would have because of the sustaining power. Sometimes God will not deliver you, but he will sustain you and he will hold you and he will pour out his loving kindness on you because what is coming in your life is great and mighty and God will pour out his presence over you and he will do something in your home, in your family, in your loved ones. God will do something in your situation that will never have happened if he just delivered you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Sometimes he just sustains you. And we say, God, you have done nothing. And God says, I'm sending you rags. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with those rags? Put them under your arms. Because I'm lifting you up. <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> what do these underarm rags teach us? There's two little things I, I just gather from these rags. Number one there, God is concerned for the minute details of our suffering. God is concerned for the details. <laughs> Could God deliver Jeremiah? Yes? Could he? Only two people are answering. Could God deliver Yes, God could deliver Jeremiah, but he decides not to. In fact, he lifts him up so that his bones will be okay. God says, before we deliver, before we do anything, one thing is this. I got to get you out of the pit. But God, you put me into the pit. So I got to get you out of the pit. And so God says, we're going to go through this step by step. The first step is, I'm going to make sure your arms don't pull out of your sockets. I'm going to make sure that you're going to be all right, all the way up out of the pit. <laughs> God is concerned for the minute details of our suffering. I have Luke 8.55 there. You don't have to turn there. We talked about it last week. Uh, we talked about, remember, the, the girl who Jesus raised from the dead, she, uh, J uh, J Jairus' daughter. And uh, I love that one verse, Luke 8, 55, after he raised her from the dead, he says to the parents, give her something to eat. <laughs> Why? What does it matter? Jesus just raised her from the dead. So Jesus cares about the details of our life. He cares about the details of our suffering. We are pointing to the whole situation as we see it or the lack of seeing it, and complaining to God all the while missing the details of our walk. God is meeting us in the minutia because he already knows the outcome of the situation. God already knows what he's doing. God sees way down the line. says, oh, Jeremiah, don't, don't worry. I know everything that I'm doing. I'm, I have everything in my hands. The only thing we're going to worry about right now is I'm giving you rags so that you can put them under your arms. Oh, thank you, Lord. Why, what else do we see out of the rags? Number two, God is gentle with his children. God is gentle. <laughs> if we complain and say, no, he's not, we're not talking about God, then we're talking about our situation. Our situation may not be gentle towards us, right? Is that true? How many of the, the rough, traumatic situations you've been through have been gentle? <laughs> no, none of them. I don't think any situation in our life has been gentle. Oh, there's never gentleness in our situation. Right? John 10.10. 10, the enemy comes to what? To help you out. To put his arm around you and just, you know course some money from you know he comes to steal to kill and to destroy but jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly so god is gentle with us gentle with us the rags were for two reasons for comfort for comfort and padding as leverage to lift him up and think think come on one thing was for comfort, that they would go under his arms to comfort him, but also it was for leverage. 
I don't know how many rags they sent. I, I'll tell you, it wasn't a dish rag. It wasn't a handkerchief. Maybe it was five, six, seven tunics bunched up so it could be something bulky, two big coats under his arm to get him out of the mud. He's stuck in the mud. We don't even know how deep he was. He's at least waist deep in his mud. And God is sending him rags and saying, we're getting you out. We're getting you out. And whatever I send you is used for my power and my glory. And God decided to use in this circumstance some rags. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Come on, we have two scriptures there. Somebody turn to Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And someone turn to Psalm 18, verse 35. These are so good. He's gentle with us. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. Come take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart. How about Psalm 18, verse 35? Okay. Gedrick. You have given me the shield of your deliverance, and your right hand holds me up. Your gentleness gave me grace. <laughs> I will give you my shield of deliverance, my gentleness, the gentleness of God, the gentleness of God. Can I tell you a lot of times the gentleness of God comes through the details that we are blind to see? We are complaining at God and he's saying, there's so many things I'm surrounding your life with. Don't discard them because it's the power of God over you. Okay, let's look at this last one for this number two in our message. Number two, it says, God used the pit to separate Jeremiah. God used the pit to separate Jeremiah from his enemies for a time when he could give him an exclusive moment with the king. If, if Jeremiah was not in the pit, actually, I, I believe God gave one of those wicked men the idea to throw him into the pit because their, their resolve at the moment when Jeremiah spoke was to kill him. <clears throat> so they said almost the same thing like Joseph, right? We should kill him. And somebody came up with the idea, actually, let's throw him into a pit. It'll be better. He'll die, but we don't have to see it. We won't have the actual blood on our hands. So God gave them the thought. They threw him into the pit. If Jeremiah was out with them, he would have died. If he had an audience with the king and the men knew about it, they would have killed him and the king. But God allowed him, God used the pit to separate Jeremiah. See, Jeremiah can say, oh God, look where you set me. And God can be saying to him, I'm protecting you. <laughs> That's where you're safe. No one will touch you there. No one will harm you there. Look at verse 14. Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that is the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Do not hide it from me. Verse 14 is actually pretty cool. Look at this. I, I, I broke down some of these pieces here. Interesting that Jeremiah goes from the pit in verse 6 to a holding room in verse 13. So it says they lifted him up in verse 12, verse 13. They pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes, lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Do you know why he stayed in the court of the court of the guardhouse? <laughs> yes, so they could hose him off. God lifts him up. Jeremiah goes from the pit to a shower to the house of the Lord. Look at that. Look at verse 14. Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that is in the house of the Lord. He brought him, he brought him from the pit to a shower into the house of God with the king. Actually with two kings. The king 
and the king. Hallelujah. He brought him out of the pit. He washed him. And he brought him before the king and the king. That is good. That is good. God is promoting us. Why am I in the pit? <laughs> just, just wait. Just wait. You're going to make it through. You're going to be cleaned up. And you're going to come into the house of God. You're going to come into the house of God. And you know what happens when you come into the house of God? Oh, I love this. Uh, Lord, let me see this. Psalm uh, 73. Go to Psalm 73 with me. Mm. Psalm 73. Let's see. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envying of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And there are no pains in their death. And their body is fat. Wait a minute. David is in a pit. And he's saying, God, I almost slipped. How did he almost slip? Because he's saying, you're not good to me. You're not good to me. You're not taking care of me. In fact, look at these arrogant people. They're the ones who are mocking you. They're the ones who are going to die because they're not doing what you say. And I'm in the pit. Uh -uh. Only for a moment. <laughs> they mock and they wickedly spread lies. Verse 9, they have their mouth set against heaven. Their tongue parades. They say, how does God know? He goes on and on and on. Verse 16, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. When is everything going to make sense? Oh, God will do it for you. You hold on. He will lift you up out of the miry clay. Set your feet on the rock to stay. And then he'll lead you into his house. And you'll be able to come into the house of God and say, I understand. I understand. God, you are always protecting me. Caring for me. Loving me. Honoring me. Covering me. God used the pit to separate Jeremiah. Listen, if, if you're not in sin and you are in a hard time of your life, oof, God is separating you for a moment. He's working out something. He's working something out. He's working something out in your life. And it seems like all hell is breaking loose, but God is working. God is working. Open your eyes. He is sending you rags. <laughs> he's sending you something to put under your arms to be comfortable. And he's saying, just hold on. Just hold on. I know you're hungry. I know you're thirsty. I know you're hungry. I know you're thirsty. But you're almost there. Because those who hunger and thirst, oh, you're almost there. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, what will happen? God will leave them there. Those who hunger and thirst, God will forget them. God will abandon them. God will destroy them. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. At the right moment, Jeremiah is in mud, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And at the right moment, God lifts him up, feeds him, covers him, washes him, brings him into the house of the Lord with the king. Oh, the pit's okay. The pit is all right. That's one of his benefits. How he redeems our life from the pit. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget none of his benefits. Who, who pardons our iniquities. Who heals all of our diseases. Who redeems our life from the pit. Find yourself in a pit. He redeems your life from the pit. Why? He is our redeemer. Thank you, Lord. He redeems our life from the pit. Whew.
How do we live this out? Oh, Lord, how do we live this out? Encourage you, spend the next devotional time evaluating the details in which you see God in. Praise Him for them. Cling to Him and bless vocally your situation. Bless it out loud. Bless it out loud, your situation. I bless the Lord for what I am in. I bless the Lord for what I am walking through because if I am not in sin, then God is working for purpose. Amen. And if you're in sin, repent and it'll change. But if you're not in sin and your life is all right, then God is doing something. And He knows. He knows. We don't. He does. God knows. Hallelujah. The pit is all right. The pit is all right. It's okay. God's there. Amen. Amen. God's there. You, you see that, right? God is there. God is there. But if you find yourself in the middle of a pit this morning, if you find yourself in the middle of a pit, if the situation is so hard for you at this moment, come on, just lift your hands together if it's you. Oh, Lord. Lord, so hard to see past this pit. But Lord, give me your eyes to see. Holy Spirit, remind me of the words of Jesus and help me to see the details of this situation of your hand of mercy and blessing. And Lord, it's those things that we call out and declare. You are good. Oh, Lord, everyone else in our life will point out and say, that's what your God gives you is rags. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for rags. Thank you, God, for your loving kindness towards me in the little things that make no sense. But, Lord, you're giving me comfort and you are sustaining me. You are sustaining me. Lord, in this sustaining moment, feed me, oh, God. Quench my thirst, O oh Lord. Lift up my head, O oh God. Lift up my eyes, O oh God, that I would able, be able to see nothing else but you and you alone, O oh God. But you and you alone. O oh Lord, as David so eloquently wrote in his psalm, O oh Lord, you, Jesus, are the glory and the lifter of my head. Oh, I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. You came and you lifted my head. You lifted my glory. Oh, Lord, and that's what you are doing in these pit moments. You are lifting our head. You are lifting, oh, Lord, our glory. Lord, I thank you. I cast out all confusion in the name of Jesus. It's not of you. Oh, Lord, help us to not be confused in our situation, but to see clear in our situation as you promised to do. Lord, you are faithful. You are faithful. Lord, I pray that you would guard us this morning. I come against every seed of the enemy that he may be trying to plant while we are walking through this situation. Oh, Lord, we come against that confusion. We come against this anxiety. We come against feelings of sadness and depression and the, the overwhelming, looming darkness that tries to, to raise its head, oh, God. You have not given us, oh, Lord, a spirit of fear. But what we do declare, Jesus, this morning is that you have given us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and of a sound mind. This, oh God, is the inheritance in the saints. That we would be enlightened. Lord, let it be. Let it be in our life, oh God, hallelujah. Let it be in our life as we hold on to you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we remind ourselves of your word. Even in 1 Thessalonians 5, you declared, oh God, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. We thank you, Lord. 
for our circumstance. For this is your will for me. Hallelujah. Help us, O God, not to complain and not to put out your Spirit's fire. O God, give us insight. Release us, O God, from an earthly way of seeing things. And give us, O God, even as, as Elisha prayed for a servant, give us your eyes to see. Open our spiritual eyes that we would see. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We ask you, O God, to favor us as we walk in action forward. We release this and settle it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He redeems your life from the pit. Thank you, Lord. It's all right. Hallelujah. God is for us. Amen. Praise God this morning. The Lord should cover you, touch you, bless you in a mighty way. Amen. You receive it this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance over you and give you peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you this morning as we put our hope and trust in.